Welcome everyone again to the Learning to Birth webinar series where we interview some of the world's most interesting and inspiring thought leaders around birth and pregnancy and the postpartum. And today we have a very special guest whom I love and adore, Suzanne Swan. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Great to be here. <laughs> Everyone, Suzanne uh, has a very special role in my life. Suzanne was actually the very first uh, childbirth education teacher I ever learned from, whose classes I ever went to. And uh, Suzanne has had many, many years experience teaching yoga for mums and bubs. So uh, just to introduce Suzanne a little bit more professionally than that maybe so you know <laughs> you know what Suzanne's up to. Suzanne Swan is founder of Yoga Baby, a specialized fertility, pregnancy, birth, mums and bubs yoga school in Australia. She's a postgraduate in psychology, a senior yoga teacher and an advanced educator with Childbirth and Parenting Educators Australia. And you've certainly had a huge impact on many, many uh, birthing parents' lives in Australia. Suzanne, do you want to introduce yourself to us and, and how you came on this amazing journey to be where you are? Great. Uh, my name is Suzanne and um, I've been uh, teaching yoga and pregnancy and birth for about 20 years now. I actually um, got inspired by my own pregnancies. I was in a pregnancy, yoga. I was actually in a yoga class and when my teacher very gently touched my stomach and said, oh, I said, he said, are you feeling okay? And I said, oh, I'm not so sure. I feel a little bit strange. And the next week I was in his pregnancy yoga class. So I was very um, pleased to be able to um, learn pregnancy yoga from a man, which is very unusual, um, but allowed me to understand that anyone um, can teach yoga and any woman, pregnant woman can, you know, experience it. And um, when I was uh, pregnant, I was able to do active birth. So I read lots of active birth books with um, Janet Velasquez as an inspiration. And um, about four years later, I was able to study with her. And she inspired me to integrate birth education and yoga together and share that with women because yoga is so much um, moving ourselves into the natural state um, and when we birth we really birth well when, when we're in that natural state so I think um, it's a beautiful lifestyle and practice to integrate when you're a pregnant mummy and that's what inspired me and here I am teaching it I just it made it it was very easy to teach because um, women responded so well to um, the, the practical aspects of yoga the breathing relaxation Hmm. And you don't have to stop it. That's the thing that really got me was that when I was pregnant, then I birthed my babies and I was in my postnatal period. Yoga was what sort of continued, was the continuum between all those different phases. So I was always able to touch base with myself. Yeah. It's very hard to communicate just online here, the complete like deep peace that a mother experiences in the nest you know and nurturing environment of your classes it's it's truly beautiful it was probably one of the first experiences I had in my life of just coming into a room and feeling totally accepted and welcomed for who I was right in that moment in time no matter what I was feeling or experiencing or thought about myself and and uh, yeah I'm, I'm still I'm still enraptured and in love with those bolsters. I still have, <laughs> I still have sexy dreams about them at nighttime. Oh, those bolsters. Suzanne has amazing bolsters. That was my first experience. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Learning how to rest well. Well done. <laughs> yes. You yes. taught mums how to rest. You teach mums how to rest. When, when the, when the um, mums come to you for mum, like pregnancy yoga, is that sometimes their very first experience of yoga or do they come having already done yoga practice? Yeah, it's very. So some women come having done yoga, you know, before maybe in a gym or maybe they've, you know, been practicing in a studio, but lots of women choose pregnancy yoga um, when they've never done it before because it's safe. So, you know, 
we, we know there's enough research out there to say that yoga is a wonderful practice to do in pregnancy. It's safe. Um, and they want to do something that's safe. So it makes sense that they get sort of, they start to move towards yoga as possibly assisting them to have an easier pregnancy, physically more comfortable. And also with that possibility that maybe it might help them with their birth. So, you know, it's, it's always a hesitancy of, you know, what am I here for? Am I here just to do exercise or am I here to learn something about myself or connect with my baby? Um, or maybe this might even help me, you know, into the birth and beyond. So I think women come, first of all, with this sense of there's something there and then they find that, you know, they meet themselves. They meet themselves in the yoga. Um, and then they discover, okay, I'm here for me. <laughs> I'm here for my baby. I'm here for me. Yeah, not so much for fitness. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So you act, uh, actually offer active birth education classes and active birth yoga too. And, and I was so grateful to find out about that course and that workshop with you whilst I was doing your classes. And uh, I came along and did the weekend or weekends with you doing active birth. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what active birth is? Hmm. So active birth in the definition by Janet Velasquez is really about a woman participating in the experience of birth fully um, as an equal participant to all those that care for her. Uh, it's instinctive. It's the woman following her own physiology, her logic of her body. So that means that it's her following her natural state. Um, so what I've done with active birth is because I'm a very much an experiential learner. So I learn through doing. So you, I know I can read a book. I know I can listen to a podcast. I know I can um, listen to stories. But when I actually learn through the physical movements um, of what I might be doing to give birth, um, what, might, what I might be experiencing physically and emotionally, mentally, then I'm, 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 I don't know, I just, I'm, I'm able to learn better. So that's the way I teach. So I like to teach um, the different topics that we talk about that are really good for women to do to help them with their birth. I like to kind of transfer that into some way of them feeling it, yeah, mentally, physically, emotionally, even spiritually. So how do we touch surrender? You know, so everyone goes, oh, we have to surrender to our births, but how do we touch surrender now? How can we practice it now? So it's, it's familiar, familiar for a woman when she's birthing her baby. So the active birth um, have developed over the last two decades has actually just evolved, evolved into um, a variety of different skills, skill bases. So those skills that we looked at is, you know, how can a woman relax? You know, mm. Is it just simply a matter of creating the environment for relaxation or is there something we can do more internally to help ourselves relax? And then we look at how do we release fears? So as you relax, you know that fears will come. Come, you know, thoughts, feelings, emotions, um, the unconscious seems to arise in that state of, of relaxation as you enter into it. When you're deeply relaxed, it's not there. There's peace. Yeah? But on the way into relaxation, there's always this what if, can I really let go? Um, what do I need to, what's holding me still here? And so we explore, you know, releasing those fears and turning them into affirmations because behind every fear is something that's very positive for you, something that you can carry you forward, you know. So a fear generally holds us back. But if, if you're able to affirm the direction in which you want to go, then you can use that quite powerfully. So I think women that, um, you know, birth well, often birth well because they've released fears, yeah, that they're letting go, they're constantly being able to be present to the fears that arise in the moment to moment and being able to let go of those to move into that new space that the, the labour and birth is taking them into. Um, we explore positioning. So I'm really, uh, I think um, there's a lot of movement around the world that the last two decades have brought heaps of great um, women, um, educators that have really explored and midwives have really explored what is going on for a woman when she births a baby. And I think we're way into getting 
much more physiological, much more um, um, engaging with women, just not watching a woman give birth and sitting back and watching it happen, but also if she needs it to become involved in that process to help her to release and relax and open. So a lot of the work I do is around what muscles and ligaments and how the pelvis and how the baby and how everything all fits together in that physical perspective, yeah? Knowing that the emotional body, um, the mental body and the spiritual body all integrate together when we birth. But looking at it from that physical perspective, um, we look at how the baby's positioned and then that's only three of the skills we learn out of eight. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to talk about all of them, but you know, there's, there's, I, I've identified that there's different skills that will assist a woman to birth her baby. And um, I share them in the classes and I'll be sharing them online next year in 2020, which is great. Yes. Yeah. That'll be fantastic. We'll talk more about your course yeah. really soon. And we can unpack some of that because yeah. some of what you talk about we can probably talk a little bit more about I guess for you, the most beautiful thing I think coming to your workshops and I mean some but I think parents might not know this that you know giving birth on a bed either on all fours or on your back it's not your only option there's many other ways mm. you can give birth and that was some of the things we did in your class like we went through all the props and all the different positions yeah. do you want to talk about maybe some of those options than a mum might experience whilst giving birth that she might not have known about? So, um, again, you can look at a book and say, oh, that's a really wonderful birthing position. I, I'm going to try that out in my labour and birth. But unless you actually get there and you try it out, it may actually just stay in the mental realm and not really be accessible for you in the time of birth when actually the mental realm disappears and the emotional, physical realm really is present as well as the spiritual realm. So... I, um, we, I like to do what I call simulations. So we would do stations. I don't know if you remember those stations where we would have um, what it might be like to birth, um, you know, standing, like how you would move and how you would, um, you know, use, your, use the props like chairs or balls or bolsters to rest more deeply on. Um, and I really, I think after years of teaching, you know, women about second stage positions and how to empower ourselves to be more upright and to be in a neutral spine so we do have that direction of force with us and it's about breathing our babies out rather than having to push our babies uphill. That means that we actually probably need to learn how to be in that state and be in that um, physical position more naturally and more easily. So a lot of women, when I talk about coming up onto all fours and putting their hands on their hips and going into a high kneel, will often feel, oh, that's really interesting position, but it's not something that they do in everyday life. You know, I, I don't know where we do a high kneel in everyday life. We might when we're picking up or, you know, putting our clothes on our toddlers <laughs> and dressing our children <laughs> regularly, but in most aspects, we're either standing or we're sitting. And so even, you know, I've had times where women going on to all, to all fours, they feel like, oh, is this a sexual position? Yeah. Is this a position in that I can actually be in like comfortably and naturally? And, you know, because unless we're scrubbing a floor, yeah, <laughs> wiping something off the floor, when are we on all fours in our, in our everyday life? So what what is it that keeps things functional and normal. Like it is functional to be on uh, in a high kneeling position it is functional to be on all fours. It's even functional to squat and to, um, to go into a half crouch, but it's not what we do every day yet. We're expecting women to go, okay, well, if I'm not going to birth on my back, then let's birth upright. So it, for me, it's like, well, let's do those positions now and, and notice that when we come upright, and we breathe, we can actually breathe our babies down, especially if we, you know, take the energy down with our breath as well. So I like to, yeah, I like to do that in the classes. And I think I've been teaching this thing about rolling over, you know, so we might find ourselves on our backs um, in the beginning of the pushing phase simply because that's our caregiver's preference. And then it would be about making choices, like do I want to be here? So it's that question of tuning in with yourself and asking yourself, do I need to rest more? Or do I need to move more? Do I want to be here? Yeah. Could I be somewhere else? And that's a choice that we make. 
And I think women need to be empowered to know that that choice is there in second stage in the pushing phase, that it's not just about um, accepting lying on your back to give birth, but to make choices about what else you can do, which could be moving onto your side, moving onto all fours, coming up into a high kneel. You can do all of this in a bed. It's a bit precarious, get your partners involved. But um, yeah, and that's what we practice in the classes. So it's, I think really useful to try it out, you know, try it out at home, just try it. What would it be like to birth in this position? You know, and really sort of feel it out so it gets comfortable. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, we did do a lot of all falls. I remember that in your classes. Uh, getting those, yeah. <laughs> those babies into their optimal positions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lots of breathing, rolling hips. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you want to talk a little bit about breathing the baby down? Because you've just jogged a part of my mind then, and you must have talked about that during my first pregnancy, but I didn't get it really, I didn't really get that right till my second pregnancy. I know, right? <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. in my first pregnancy, right, um, I think I was doing what you'd guided us to do, but then the pressure of the caregivers, I, I kind of like buckled and I was like, oh, they're telling me to push, I'll push. Yeah. And things went pear shaped then. <laughs> But uh, the second pregnancy, I was like, I'm bringing this baby out. And if anyone tries to tell me different, I banned them from the room. So do you want to tell us like what breathing the baby out is opposed to pushing and what the benefits of that might be? Because I don't think a lot of people necessarily have even heard about this option. Okay. Um, I think it's everyone's personal experience and that no one can actually tell us how to birth our babies. Uh, I, I've heard enough birth stories, um, women coming back and sharing, just like you did with me now, sharing what it was like for you. And everyone's experience is very unique. So that I just want to be able to say that because I think a woman needs to li listen to her body um, during that pushing phase. Uh, it's possible that two centuries ago, no one ever said the word push to a woman. It's possible, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that it's an introduced um, practice that we that is unnecessary yeah so we talk about breathing in a relaxed way during the first stage of labor to make sure that your muscles aren't tensing in resistance to the surges and then when it comes to second stage we could do the same possible yeah so it might be that you may need to give some intonation you might need to give some maternal effort to your uterus but it's actually your uterus that's pushing your baby out so what more do we need to do unless called by the uterus? So if your body's saying, I need a bit more, then you give a bit more, yeah? Just like you would do in anything. Whereas if someone's on the outside telling you to push, they have, they're not, they don't know. And it's a confusion. So if you're listening to someone and you're not being encouraged to listen to your body by those people staying quiet, then you're probably going to find that your attention is pulled out of your body and you're no longer in touch with that natural pushing push. So some women, if you've had an epidural, you'll need to be coached. You'll probably need to be told when to push, how long to push, and they'll guide you to do that. But in its own natural state, a woman finds her way. Yeah. So it might be that like your second birth, there was no need to push. Your baby came through the memory, yeah, through the already having that muscle relaxation before when you first birthed your first baby. Everyone just, yeah, it's very, I think it's very unique and that's where breathing the baby out is about taking the energy down. So we do talk about Delabanda, which is the throat lock in yoga. So when we apply the different bandhas, so you've got the, the mula bandha, which is where the cervix is, the opening of the cervix, the gateway for the baby. You've got the crown, yeah, which is where, you know, the energy is flowing through. So what we want to do is as we feel that desire to move our baby with our baby, we just drop the jalabanda the, and create the throat lock and that sends the energy down. So along with the breath is the energy of prana or life force that you are birthing this baby out through your vagina. So when I say that, and I also know that sometimes there's this feeling, and a lot of women give me feedback, that I felt there was no progress. And it's true. There is a period of time in second stage where you don't feel any extra, you know, like you're not feeling like you're getting anywhere, that this is a true kind of 
feeling. There's not a lot of movement until the baby's right there on the perineum crowning. You're not going to necessarily feel um, that it's moving down. It's got that feeling of perhaps moving back up and then you having to give some more maternal effort to help the baby down. So there is this kind of a... Im mm, I think I find that most women have in the second stage pushing when they come back and tell their stories, there's a sense of confusion perhaps of how to push and that's where the caregivers can often intercede and that's where we can lose it because we doubt. And I think it's mm -hmm. patience. I think we have to be patient, be really, really patient. Take upright positions to assist with the downflow or not. Put your head down one up and just say, I don't want to do it anymore because perhaps the movement of the baby off the pressure on the muscles might actually relax them. So the next time you come up, you then feel the desire more stronger and the baby comes down. So it's kind of being able to listen to your body and freedom of movement, freedom of movement, a woman being free to move, to listen to her body and birth her way. It would be my yeah. Yeah, take home message. <laughs> oh, this is, this is really, this is such a, an important um, discussion because you know, where, how our baby comes out of us and how much control we have over that, how much agency we have over that, given that it's our body and what we are feeling down there, you know, it can really have long impacts upon us, you know, like whether we tear or other things happen or our pelvic floor. So yeah. we'll just like sit on this just for a little bit longer. That's a terrible yeah. pun. I'm sorry. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the appropriate place to be on our sit bones. Yes. Yeah. What if, what if someone like a caregiver is like, if you don't push that, like if you, if, like breathing a baby out, it's, it delays and you need to get that baby out as soon as possible. Like, because I know that like when they're down there, like they can't do very much feed, like Doppler monitoring or monitoring or anything like that. It's once they're down, they're about to come out and, and we just, if we're just breathing it, things take longer because we're not pushing. Is there a, like, how should a mum if people are saying, no, push that baby out now because you know, they can't monitor the baby. How should a mum kind of, know how to respond in that situation when she's like, no, I want to breathe my baby out. Tricky. Yeah. I think, I think it's a, it's a conversation that you have before you're there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about the birth yeah. choices that you make, who's in the birth room with you, their birth preferences for delivery. I don't like to use the word delivery, but um, during the birthing phase, it's, it's like, as you know, there's they, that, that influence is there. So I think it's tricky at that point in time to find that, um, that self-efficacy, to know what to do in those circumstances when you're meeting, um, you know, someone saying something and you're not feeling exactly what they're, they're saying. So I would say that, that you need to talk to your caregivers beforehand about your birth preferences and check in about their preferences. And what they need to be asking you is, what do you want? So when you're with your um, caregiver and you're talking about different preferences or different um, options that you have for birthing the second stage, it's really important to have that precursor conversation and that they ask you what you want. If they're just saying what we do here is, then you're going to probably find that there's going to be possibly disempowerment through the process. Yeah. You need to find someone who asks you what you want and to have a conversation. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's really the nutshell, like the essence of it, isn't it? Because I, I wouldn't have even have known to say, hey, I'm going to breathe my baby out. Is that okay with you? I don't think they would have even known what that was, <laughs> honestly. But so, you, but you could, if you wanted to breathe your baby out, you could have discussion about what and how yeah. do um, the carers um, offer coaching or no coaching? Because we're talking about mm -hmm. no coaching here. We're talking about not coaching a woman um, to push. Um, but to let her have her own timing and birthing preference for position. Yeah. But when there's a call for, we have to, you know, that when you talk about um, them not knowing what's going on and how long, sometimes I think when we leave a woman to do it herself, we have got the fetal ejection reflex. That is a biological experience that all women do have. However, you know, most women have a fetal ejection reflex when they're in a private space, not observed, not on their backs, yeah? So more women have those quicker breathing the baby out experiences when they are in a more safe private space like a pool, a water pool, yeah? In a dimly lit environment with loved ones around them, no one saying anything other than you're doing really well, keep going, yeah? 
So that's there too. That's really important to know. Oh, this is all really good stuff. Thank you, Suzanne. Do you want to talk at all, like we, we mentioned a little bit before about optimal, also about, you know, positioning. And I remember your classes, particularly your yoga classes, focus a lot on that. Do you, mm. want, to, do you want to talk about that, what that is? Like what is like fetal positioning? Because sometimes we might not even know what position our baby is in or that we have some sort of agency over that. Yeah. Well, your baby's in the most perfect position. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah, there's no right position. Um, your baby is finding their way um, and they're getting as comfortable as they can within you. Uh, so there's been quite a good movement um, in the last couple of decades around how we perceive babies um, and the baby's own agency. So it is the baby who rotates. It is the baby who births um, themselves and we assist them or we make space so we create the environment for that to occur. So whenever we're held up or we're stuck or we're feeling discomfort or pain, and this is in pregnancy as well as in birth, it's a sign, it's an indicator, it's, it's, it's information that we can then use to perhaps mm, do something to create change or do less. So I'm not always talking about doing more. Sometimes the, the, the perspective in our life to do less may actually move us forward more elegantly or we might touch the flow rather than feeling like we're having to make our baby move into a good position. Perhaps if we took more time out to garden or um, we didn't work as hard during our pregnancies or we didn't prioritise our work over our babies, um, then, you know, sometimes when, we, when babies go breach, it's because the mum is busy and the message to the baby is... I'm not ready. You're not ready. I'm not ready. So I'll, I'll put my head up and, and I'll wait till you <laughs> tell me when it's time because women are often, you know, finishing their PhD, moving house, um, oh, renovating. Oh, what about my mum's not here in the country? You know, so there's, really, there's all these messages that the baby gets about, hey, I'm not ready. So a lot of the position is about the mother moving into the mood and taking the space so that the baby can then, you know, say yes. Because I love this. I love saying this too in the classes that when you know when you when you're communicating to your baby that the world is safe, if you feel that the world is safe, then it's going to be make it much more conducive and desirable for your baby to come into the world. And so I think when we talk about positioning, we're really looking at that emotional aspects for the mother. You know, do you feel safe? Have you made the space? Are you, are you communicating that you're We're talking through the pregnancy. We're not just talking about, oh, at the last two weeks of my, my pregnancy, I'll start making space. It's kind of like, can we start making that space earlier? So the baby feels that they can fill it up as well. So definitely in class, we work on muscles, ligaments, um, bones, uh, gravity, uh, all the things that, you know, yoga is wonderful at. You know, yoga is really wonderful at, you know, helping you become more mobile releasing your ligaments, yeah, and stretching out tight muscles and tightening weak muscles. So I can even use my shoulder joint as a way of doing that. But to, you know, help us to come into alignment, yeah, and so when we're in alignment, so when we're balanced and in alignment, everything's going to flow. Everything's going to fit in nicer and everything's going to flow better. So the baby will take the space that you create for it and a balanced space is what's going to optimise your baby's rotation through the pelvis. Uh, nowadays, we've got some great work by um, um, a whole lot of women across the world. And so what we're learning is that there's not just, it's not just, um, you know, okay, 10 years ago, we thought if we just do this position and move this way, the baby will move. We, we actually believe that when we move the mother, we move the baby. And um, this is more in the physiological sort of childbirth realm. Now what we're looking at is actually... Um, we talk differently. We say, okay, if we can make the space, if we can create um, that relaxation and balanced muscle structure, then the baby themselves rotates. Yeah? So we're making the baby an agent um, that moves through the body that, you know, if you can simply relax and release and move into that peaceful state, then we're in tune, then um, the baby moves through us. So it's not really about the baby's positioning yeah so so sometimes we can get um overly 
overly focused or worried or fearful about, is my baby in the right position? Yes, your baby will take the position they need to, to birth and you can assist that. Yeah. Mm. It's incredible, isn't it, how the baby, you know, twists and spins as it comes out because until you kind of see it and know it, like you just think, oh, they just sort of come out. But no, they kind of they yeah. twist and they Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> All life moves through a spiral. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> everything, everything in creation has gone through uh, the... And the formation of a spiral, a spiral, the organ, the, the formless organ called the spiral. <laughs> yeah. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I don't, I, anyway, <laughs> I, I won't go into using that language, but I'm, <laughs> like, it just makes sense. So uh, do you want to talk about mums and bubs yoga? Like, because how is that important, like, for the postpartum period? What does that do? Um, for a new parent and their baby yeah so you know I wish that we had this this place between birth and when they can come to a mums and bubs yoga class to participate uh, where a mother is held in it that you know in a beautiful space so I'm just going to acknowledge that we have that fourth trimester uh, which is the time after the baby's born and then there's a time when you go into the world yeah you start to integrate back into the world and I think most mums feel it way too early that we could, you know, hold that space for longer. So maybe four weeks, you know, of without having to, gen, you know, enter into the world. And then we usually see women wanting to come back and do mums and bubs yoga probably from that four weeks. But the baby, you know, the baby is yet to be ready to enter into a yoga class and be stimulated by noise and other babies crying and the teacher talking and the music. And so... <laughs> Uh, we generally have to be very patient and wait a little bit longer. So most babies are really comfortable in the class around eight weeks, six to eight weeks. And um, when they enter into the class, uh, it's quite beautiful. So the mother's always eager to be there. You know, a mum wants someone to hold her baby so she can stretch out on those yoga bolsters again and totally relax as if she's back in yoga again, <laughs> doing, doing that yes. solitary pregnancy yoga class again. It's like... Oh no, the baby cries. The baby needs to be fed. The baby wants to be held. Oh, where's my yoga? And so the mums and bubs yoga class is, as best we can make it, a place where the mother can come and be surrounded by other mothers uh, as she bonds and, you know, attaches with her baby in public, in public breastfeeding, in public and doing all that attachment and bonding cues and responses in public. And sort of be with a lot of like-minded women doing the same thing and at the same time working out how do I do like yoga? How do I separate from my baby to think about myself at the same time as caring for my baby? And I think that's the beautiful thing about mums and bubs yoga is that at home you're generally going, I'm doing everything for the baby and then I'm doing housework or I'm cooking or I'm, you know, I'll, I'll take that really quick shower. Oh, I forgot to eat. <laughs> and then there's... A, have I drunk enough water today to get my milk up? Um, so in the class, we just get this little time to be able to go, okay, can I think about myself? Can I breathe? Can I stretch my muscles? Can I strengthen? Um, can I stretch those aches? And at the same time, can I integrate that with my baby? Can I pick my baby up in the middle of a posture and put them on me? And can I keep doing a yoga posture with my baby on me? They cry. I have to give up the yoga posture. Right. So there's a surrender again to motherhood, parenthood, <laughs> which is always that, you know, that pull between self and other, self and other, and, and learning to that balance, I think, is a lifetime of parenting. It doesn't come straight away to know how do I find that balance. And uh, we, when mums and bubs come to the yoga class, um, you know, they enter in, we do a really beautiful sequence with the babies, we do baby yoga, very, very cute. Um, and then we go on to do um, yoga with the mums. And then we do, hopefully, a long relaxation at the end where they get to, where you get to, um, yeah, practice some of that shavasana, yeah, which might feel like, oh, a little bit of time for me. Yeah. And a little time can feel and fill in a big gap if that sleeplessness is set in from the night before and the night before. Yes. <laughs> 
and the week and the month and the, <laughs> yeah. the, back, the backlog, the backlog is kind of, but what we do know is, you know, 15 minutes of legs up the wall can equal four hours of a good sleep. So that's what we might need sometimes. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Those legs up the wall or legs on the chair, like from my yoga classes with you, like best experience of my life. If ever I want to like, just go back and just find some peace. Like if there's some drama moment, I'm just like, give birth my chair i need my legs up that chair and <laughs> i go back to your yoga class <laughs> you mentioned there just like for a little uh briefly like attachment and uh it's not something you offer now but you did previously like little courses and attachment parenting but some of the parents listening here today might not even know what attachment parenting is do you want to explain a little bit about what attachment parenting is and how might that be different from just a general like parenting term so I'm going to do a little bit of a, a go back in, in, when I was a, a parent. Um, mm. So as a, as a new mum, there was something that was really important to me and was that was being able to be responsive to my baby's needs. And um, in those days, in those days, um, that responsiveness had a different um, um, judgment from the community. So some people would say that, you know, if you pick up your baby too much, you're making a rod for your back. You're spoiling your baby. And so to actually want to carry your baby around in your arms, in a sling, to sleep with your baby if that was safe, to breastfeed your baby long term, and to um, be there with your child as they grow in their emotional intelligence wasn't actually necessarily considered the best parenting style. <laughs> and it's probably still, there is still, maybe still there. And the question is, the question is out there, you know, do babies really grow when they've given attention? And the answer is yes. The research has definitely said and shown that when we give our children attention, their emotional intelligence grows because they feel safe. They feel connected and with the emotional intelligence comes high thought, empathy, better decision making, impulse control. So attachment parenting is just a beautiful term to describe a way or style of parenting, which means that you're going to be attentive to your child's needs. Now, it's not that you have to answer all needs with an action. Yeah, it's not, um, uh, what is it? It's not like you're a, you're a waterfall and you're going to be, uh, you know, giving, 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 because that will actually drain you. Attachment parenting with intelligence, attachment parenting with um, boundaries, with ways of saying, you know what, you know, I know that you might want that, but I think it'd be better that, we do something else or perhaps um, this might interest you or we could wait a little while. Yeah. So that, that intelligence of helping your child set boundaries around their needs grows with them, grows with them. Yeah. So when they're little, they're an umbilical cord. You know, when the baby is first born between you and the baby, umbilical cord. That's no, they don't know there's any separation between you and them. It's, it's free flowing. Yeah, so that free flowing can happen. But as they grow older and their will develops and their capacity to see themselves as separate, well, we should see ourselves separate as well and start creating those healthy boundaries with our babies while staying present with their emotions. So attachment parenting is um, about developing your child's emotional intelligence through providing secure attachment. And I'd like to share a little bit of research that's been done recently that I've got really excited about. So uh, they did a study looking at the responsiveness of a mother um, over a period of two years to her child. And what they discovered was that 70% um, 70 70 of the time when we respond to our children's needs, we get it wrong. <laughs> yep, you missed the bit. You missed it. You thought your baby cried for a feed, they didn't need a feed. You thought your baby cried for a change of nappy, they didn't need the nappy change. How many times has that happened? Plenty. Yeah. So often it's incongruent. What we have is incongruent responsiveness. So what is beautiful to know is that it's not important that 
um, you've got it wrong, but that you responded. So attachment grows through the responsiveness of your, your attention rather than getting it right. Mm. So respond to your baby. Even if you're wondering, what do I, I don't know what they need. You just go, okay, let's check it out. Let's spend some time, eye-to-eye -eye contact, being present to your baby. That then turns into um, a more intricate and um, well-developed parenting style that you probably need more education about, you know, read more about what it is to be an attached parent. And there's lots of really good writers out there that have lots of great advice on how to support a child into adulthood. And just oh having, gosh. yeah, and just want to share, you know, having an adult and you've got a teenager, yeah. <laughs> it's like birthing a whole new baby all over again because oh, like, when the eldest they're always pushing 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 and you're just like trying to breathe <laughs> yeah, I, I just it's like teenagers it's like having a toddler yeah all over again but you can't lift them up because they're too big <laughs> but the kind of style of parenting that you did with them when they were babies and toddlers is really manifested in that style as a teenager. So if you're open communication with gentle discipline, not discipline that, you know, causes them fear or to turn away or to separate from you, but connected parenting, then you're going to see that as teenagers, you've got some communication, you've got some connection um, and the gentle discipline still has to be there. Maybe a bit stronger sometimes, a bit more boundaries. You weren't so good at them. <laughs> and then I'd just like to share with you that as adults, having, I've got adult children, it's like, wow that's pretty special and what you find is that through that attachment style parenting that as adults their emotional intelligence their ability to listen to communicate to tune in to look after you is there too so you know you've matured young people that have good empathy good responsiveness to other people's needs but also aware of their own boundaries as well Yes, it's beautiful. I utterly agree with everything you've said, Suzanne. And uh, it's, it's really important, I think, to consider it because, you know, we're talking here about, you know, jobs of the future. They're not going to be, you know, with AI and machine learning, it's going to be the jobs of the future are going to be based around our emotional intelligence. And so we need to think about emotional intelligence is actually a vital skill now that we need to give our children and how do we foster that in them uh it's attachment parenting it's that it's modeling that um, the emotional response so that when they you know cry for something and we don't know what it is or when they're a bit older like a, a toddler or a young child and they're acting out or a teen and acting out we know it's really the, the response from us yeah. that they're looking for to, to deeply, you know, insecurely and emotionally attach rather than the, yeah. any, you know, physical thing that we can well, give them. So I would say that we ourselves have to be um, grounded because we have mm -hmm. to be the mature adult through which they can anchor that wild emotional states until they learn. So I'd like to come back to mm, how, do we, how do we come to that natural state that's in us, that mature self that we have in us that's able to sit still while they themselves change and um you know just coming back to the pregnancy and linking in with the pregnancy a lot of the pregnancy yoga classes that i teach are about connecting the mother to the actual reality that the baby is conscious that this being inside of them is a conscious human being capable of feeling thinking yeah and so um that, you know, turning a mum's attention to her baby during the pregnancy and giving attention to the baby as a whole human being then starts that journey from the beginning. So, you know, acknowledging the baby as being part of the birth journey. And as the baby comes into the world, acknowledging them as, in, you know, fully formed human being with, you know, a, a pure, you know, fully formed limbic system, their emotional brain, is actually ready and responsive from birth. So it's engaging with that emotional intelligence within ourselves to be calm, to be relaxed, yeah? And if not, to, to find ways of moving to, towards that state through, for me, through practices of yoga, I've found that I've been able to come back to myself 
Yeah, even though you know life circumstances have thrown me off sideways many times, and um, you know physical challenges, um, relationship challenges, all those things have been there. But there's this core, there's this core practice of being able to come back to oneself that yoga teaches that I that I that I'm obviously really passionate about. <laughs> So that's what I'd encourage them to take up the practice of yoga during the pregnancy um, to connect with the baby. Yeah. In that emotionally connecting way, you know, that way where you, you sit with your feelings rather than trying to fix anything, just sit with your feelings and, and be present to the joy and pleasure of being pregnant, to the joy of giving birth um, and not being hooked into the fear, the worry, the trying to get it perfect um, that we, that our society kind of really, uh, can get us a little bit overly, you know, I don't know, we do more, you know, doing more. We have to do more. What would happen if we did less? Yeah. Beautiful. Do you want to tell us about your amazing, incredible plans for your active birth courses to be online uh, in 2020? Okay. Um, so the work that I've done over the last um, two decades of creating the, the Active Birth Yoga series, so it's a series of eight topics that we explore in the classes and I've workshopped them with the women. So we've kind of worked out what, what positioning, what kind of practices, breathing, relaxation, really get us to experience it experientially. So we're looking at those topics that I ca um, covered before. We're looking at relaxation, We'll be looking at um, releasing fears, um, positioning, you know, the whole where's my baby. Um, we're going to be looking at the use of visualisation. I didn't talk very much about visualisation, but the power of your imagination to birth your baby. We're going to explore the breath. I'm sure everyone uh, likes to know how does the breath, you know, support my pregnancy and birth. And then we'll look at vocalisation, the power of sound um, and explore all the different birthing positions and how they can assist us to maybe shorten our labours, perhaps if not shorten them to help us to navigate our labours. Um, and active birth is all about that knowing that there is choice. So what is what are my choices available to me in different birthing set, settings? Um, and if I don't have a choice, then what do I do? How do I how do I journey with this? Yeah. How do I surrender to my baby's birth being my baby's birth? So that's part of the series is to look at active birth from the perspective of um, birthing positions, breathing, yoga, and also from um, the active birth philosophy or manifesto of giving women choice around their birth, being informed. And that's going to come out in 2020 and along with um, my book that I'm going to write as a companion, I'm already started writing it. I've been um, working on material for many years. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just get too busy teaching. I'm, I'm, I teach a lot. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're making a real impact on every, like every day on real women's lives. So yeah. that's really hard to work. How can, how can listeners today come and follow you online? Where are you on social media? Yeah, so um, on Facebook, we're under Yoga Baby Australia, hashtag Yoga Baby Australia for Instagram as well. And you can visit my website, yogababy.com.au, uh, just to read some of the articles, maybe even look at the blogs. Um, send me an email, asking questions is great. I'm really happy to share and to help. Well, I'm hoping that uh, the viewers all around the world get to see you and read this book and take this course with you because, yeah, we didn't talk about visualization. We didn't, you know, all that sort of stuff is so important, but it's going to be in your course <laughs> and you can always come back again next year and do a little talk with us here and, and tell us more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, having here with us today, uh, Suzanne and, uh, I guess uh, I should ask you, I ask everyone a question before they go. Like I just ask a really general question and um, I haven't really thought one up for you, <laughs> but I'm just wondering, I'm just, cause it's like, I'm just, I'm just sort of like wondering what question I should ask you. Like that's really general. 
that you can share with us. And, you know, I just, you've just got so much to give the world and you're such a beautiful, radiant being. And I just hope so many people could come, you know, maybe and, and learn with you, your, your courses. But, you know, if, if women really do feel that sense of choice and, and pleasure, I guess, that you've talked about during their birth, uh how will how will the world change do you think mm, that's a big question mm. how will the world change if we we as women were given choices and we chose to make those choices with pleasure and love mm. well i think we go on to manifest a new generation <laughs> yeah of people that um were empowered to to see the good in each other and to be able to maybe think about the way the world is um, happening right now, that there's a lot going on on our planet. There's a lot of disconnect around heart and body, um, around how we're even using our resources and how we care for our, our, our own bodies. So my hope would be that we moved more closer into alignment um, with uh, the planet that we live on, that that, that sense of care and consideration um, that we would have for each other because we were birthed in love would, would flow onto the planet and all the creatures and all the beings that are presently here. So that would be my, that would be my hope. Mm, that's very beautiful. <laughs> and I guess, I guess if nothing else comes out of our talk today, and I'm sure a lot of the, things will come out of it. But if nothing else comes out, just if birthing parents know that they've got choice, mm -hmm. that it's their body, yeah. they get to choose. Yeah. But you've got to know, you've got to know what, what you want to. You've got to research, you know, listening to your, um, all the people that have been talking in this program, the education, the wisdom, the information, like being informed, you know, women, we can't just go and say, oh, give me the best answer. We've actually got to actually go out there and seek that for ourselves and ask those questions and, you know, know what we want and, and have that voice. So, yeah. Because no one else is going to know our best answer. You know, we've known ourselves for 20, 30, maybe 40 years. No one else has known us except maybe our mothers <laughs> that long. Yeah. We need to ask ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And bring something, bring something to the table. Thank you so much for um, your beautiful program and really, really lovely to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, again for listening. You can follow Learning to Birth at Learn to Birth on Instagram and Facebook, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne. See you. Bye-bye.